Dear brothers and sisters, I would like to share with you today the message is making sense of a confusing world. The year 2020 is a very interesting year. Many things happen at the same time. We can see that, for example, there's COVID-19, there are a lot of cases of COVID-19, there's economic crisis, Recently, there's a Supreme Court ruling about the gay rights, about their job protection. Then there is discussions in the media whether we should wear masks or not wear masks in the public. So there are a lot of things going on. There are also young people, a lot of people, whether it's black and white, marching on the street to protest for the rights of the minority, especially after the death of George Floyd. And they complain about the police uh, overuse of violence, especially against the black people. So every day you can see a lot of news coming. So there's so many bombarded at the same time. 2020 is like a perfect year, perfect year of perfect storm that's hitting you from all the fronts and you get you confused. What's the directions? There's so many different thoughts, different ideas. Which one should I follow? Which one should I believe? Sometimes you get all confused. So that's the focus of today. Hopefully this message can help you navigate in the midst of disturbance, a lot of, a lot of confusions. Let's maintain clear in mind to follow the will of God. In fact, this is actually not unexpected. Jesus, in the book of uh, Matthew, chapter 24, when he prophesied about the end time, he said that this is bound to happen. Jesus said, during the end time, you'll be deceived. Many will come in my name, claim I'm Messiah, I'm Messiah. and many fear will follow. Verse 11, many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. But because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow whole, cold. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. So hopefully, we brothers and sisters will not be deceived by the false prophets and stand firm to the end and will be saved. By the same token, in the New Testament, the Acts of Proposals, he talked about Paul. Paul, understanding that he's going to be persecuted in Jerusalem. But that's his destiny, so he's, he's rather willing to go back to Jerusalem to face this persecution. Knowing that he may not have a chance to see all the church managers from now on, so he, he bid goodbye to managers. One of the church he bid goodbye to is the Efficient church, which he has a lot of love, a lot of knowledge, because he spent a lot of time on this church. And before he left, he spoke to the elders. He said, I am going to entrust you. I give you some instructions. I would like to give you some instructions before I leave. I was, when I first read this passage, I was very touched. A lot of feelings, of feelings about departure. The Paul Apostle, Apostle Paul, told them, there will be savage wolves coming in my midst, so to watch out. I'm leaving you, I cannot help you. But you, you're the elders, you're the overseers, you have to keep watch over yourself. The Holy Spirit has made you say, overseers. I know that after I leave, what happened? Savage workers, savage, uh, savage wolves will come in to get you. The wolves who come in amongst you will not spare the flock. They will snatch some of the sheep away from the flock. And even some of this is not just from outside the church, but it's inside within your own number. So you have to 
Stand firm on your God. I can't hear you too much. I can only pray for you. And I want 32. It's very important. I like this verse a lot. I commit you to God and to the word of his grace. We'll build you up and give you inheritance among all those who are sanctified. So that's why God and his word of grace are two very important things we can count on to make sense of this confusing world. And that's the focus of today. God and his word of grace. I like one of the hymns, Christian hymns. I think you have very familiar with. It's called Thy Word. Because the word, the lyric is from Psalm, the book of Psalms in the Bible, especially uh, 119 verse 105. It says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. The word is, of course, the word of God, the word of grace. The Bible is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. What does it mean? Actually, it conveys two different meanings here. The light path is what? Just like when you drive on the highway, the light poles. And everybody drive by, we see the same light poles. There's no controversy at all. Everybody's the same. It applies to all. However, if everybody carry a lantern, when you walk, the lantern just one step ahead of you and shine maybe several steps of you. But as you move, the lantern will move for you and go on and on. But each body, everybody have their own lanterns and how you walk will guide you step by step. So from this verse, Psalm, it reminds us how to use the word of God. The two aspects. One is that you understand the the common truth, common doctrines, which apply to all. That's why you have to do inductive Bible study. We have to do uh, uh, systematic theology. And we have to understand, unearth all these wonderful biblical principles to guide our life. And everybody is the same. However, within this principle, how to guide you in a particular situation, it sums up varies from one person to another. And that's why morning devotions, good devotions, pray to God, and usually, some of the words will guide you. God will speak to you through those words. And the guidance is individual. It's different. All within the big directions, big change, change. Even without violating the general principle, there's still some minute difference across individuals. Just want to give you an example. For example, there's a lady, a sister in the church. There are two boys. Uh, both Christian boys would like to uh, chase after her. Uh, one to be the girl, one to be his wife. Now, both are Christians. The Bible says that you should not marry uh, outside the church. You should not marry a non-believer. In this case, not marrying the believer, non-believer, it applies to all people. Everybody's the same not mixing, marrying non-believers that affects your future family. It's applies to everybody. However, to the list sister, there are two boys who are both Christians. So that does not violate the principle at all. But which one, which the boy, which this gentleman will should be her husband? Then she has to pray. And do devotion, and sometimes this morning, and some of the words will directly guide her by praying devotions. God help her to make individual decisions. So the verb of God, the die word, has two important meanings: the general truth that applies to all, and also individual guidance. So Paul said. I am leaving you now, but I entrust you to the word of God and God himself. The grace, the word of grace and God, I pray for you and God will protect you at the same time, using his word to guide you, not be snatched away by the rules. So here in the beginning, in the following, I would like to talk about five types of rules that may snatch you away from the flock. And all these five rules are against God and against the word of grace. And the purpose is to fool you, just like the false, false prophets, to fool you and snatch you away from the flock. 
So let's talk about these five rules. The five different types of rules that I think are against the Bible, against God's guidance, at the same time present false or present partial truth is to deceive you away from God, to make wrong decisions. So what are the five different rules, the different rules I have in mind? The first one, the first wolf I call secular humanism. What is humanism? Secular humanism is that I myself is the ultimate judge of truth. Don't impose on me about doctrines. I experience my feelings, my need, my experience. I will be the final judge. Secular humanism is a philosophy. A lie stands. They say that we embrace human reasons, secular ethics, and rejecting any religious dogma, supernaturalism. I, as a person, will be the base of morality and decision making. It sounds very good, but it's wrong. Because human beings, on one hand, we are limited. Your experience usually limit you to a certain set. And a lot of times you're guided by your desire. So you feel differently. After all, we have sinful nature. And sinful nature sometimes distorts our protection perceptions. That's why in start reading on yourself, it doesn't mean that you do not have to make decisions, but that is the only, the only base of making decisions. You also need to listen to the one who created you, the creator. That's why we talk about revelation. Reveal truth. I think you're very familiar with the, the story about the blind people, several blind people coming to, to understand who, what the advent is like. Because they're blind, they can only have seen touch. Do they trust the reality of the, the advent? Yes, but partial truth. Some touch the, the nose and say, oh, everything's like a pipe. Oh, touch his ears, oh, everything's is a fan. And touch his tail, say, oh, everything's a snake. So when they go home and discuss what everything is like, they quarrel and fight with each other. Poor blind people. They insist on their partial experience. It's not that they do not feel the truth, but they feel the partial truth. And they insist that's the total truth, then that creates problems to themselves and to other people. We need, in this case, maybe the elephant to tell you, hey boys, I am this big animal with nose like a pipe and a belly like a wall and slick tire like a tail. And you combine the ears like a fan. If you combine, that's more or less like me. Tell them. So truth, because of the limit nature of human beings, our limitations, we have to review, listen to the creator who creates for purpose. He know all the design. We need to be humble to them. Of course, we should not be dominated by dogmatic, dogmas of religions. We have to understand the word clearly, not just uh, blindly, but we need to surrender ourselves, clearly understand the principles and yield those the important principles by the word of God. So secular humanism is one of the rules we have to be uh, very cautious about. One example in social issues about, is about abortion rights. Abortion rights activists say that, this is my body, this is my right. Why do you take my right? That's the T-shirt I want to take out. For whatever reasons, because it's not convenient time to have to be pregnant, I'll get pregnant later, but now take it away. Abortion right. Then people say, but you're kidding. Someone inside you is actually a living organism. It's your baby and you kill them before he or she is born. He said, how do you know? I don't feel that. After all, this is my body. This is my t-shirt. I just take it out. 
they feel that this is them. They do not feel that it's a living organization and they have the need. So what have they, they say this is not a, a life. It's just a t-shirt. Just take it out for convenience sake. In this case, then we have to go back to the word of grace, the creator, and from his perspective, to see what the, the fetus actually is a living organism. Jeremiah in chapter one, verse five, he says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you and before you were born, I consecrated you. I have appointed you a prophet to the nations. So before you're born, God knows us already. One further point is very serious. Exodus chapter 21, 22, 25, it says, if the man struggle and he hit a pregnant woman by the side, and what happened? The pregnant woman have to give birth prematurely. Now, if it's lucky, the baby come out not, not harmed, then okay, the woman's husband will demand some, some fine and the judge will carry out the fine and decide about the fine. But if the newborn baby has some injury or even die, what happened? Life or knife, eye for knife. If you die, then you also die. So in God's mind, what is in a woman's body is already alive. Alive or alive. So it's very clear in the word of grace that before this baby come to out of the mother's body, it's already a living human being. And if you try to kill it and get out, you kill. You kill. This violates the Ten Commandments. And that is your child. So instead of relying on your personal feeding to secular humanisms proclaim, we have to be humble ourselves to listen to what his word. What is the perspective of the creator? So as a Christian, you need to be very familiar of the word. Otherwise, people will misguide you. So that's the first wolf you have to watch out for. The second wolf I want you to watch out for is what we call, and also it's very common, a lot of people think about this, is ends justifying the means. Many people repeat that. There's nothing good or bad. It's only at the end in terms of means, there's nothing good or bad. Anything that's achieving good at the end will be the means is good. Anything that's not achieved at the end is bad. So whether the means to channel you get something done, doesn't matter. It's judged by the ends. When I was in high school, I minded in philosophy. We talk about ethics. There are two major schools of ethics. There are two major schools of ethics. One is called teleology. One is called deontology. Theology perspective is that what is ethical? Anything that you do to achieve something good, then is ethical. Anything that will get something bad at the end is unethical. But the ontology, the other schools claim, yeah, end and good ends is one thing, but the means itself also has something good and bad. You should not use some bad means to achieve something good. Your, the very fact you have the final goal achieved doesn't justify the means of using some, some dirty tricks to do that. So these are the two schools of thought, teleology and also the ontology. So let me ask you questions, which is a biblical perspective, teleology or the ontology? Teleology say a good result is worth a bad way of achieving those results. No matter what happened there, as long as you can achieve what I want, which I think is good, then I choose it. The ends justify the means. But I don't think that is the biblical perspective. I think biblical perspective is the ontology because Jesus said, it doesn't mean that something the result will change the original meaning of the way. Yes, it's yes, Matthew said. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Yes is yes, no is no. It doesn't change because of the result. Yes become no. 
or because of result, no becomes yes. Anything has its factual base. It doesn't change the nature because of the consequence. The self has the merits. You say anything beyond this, it comes from Satan, the evil one. So, brothers and sisters, don't be confused by this wolf. This is very popular among people, especially non-believers. A lot of politicians around the world use this. As long as I achieve some common good for the people, then I can sacrifice some people. This is for the common good, bigger good of the country. Let's a small, sacrifice a small minority, small group of people for the common good of many people. Even using very harsh political oppression. They try to justify that. U.S. suffered many cases of COVID-19, but under economic pressure, then the government, against the advice of the, all the health officials say that, all right, let's open up. They said, don't open us too much, otherwise there'll be explosion again, again, and then we have to pull back again and just shut down again. And the politicians, in order to justify the opening up, in order to let the economy recover sooner, then what happened? No problem. As long as you pro, pro, provide social distancing, everybody's on their guard, we can open bars, restaurants. In order to justify certain goals, they justify it. No problem. The same thing. So we wear masks or no masks. The government officials, health officials say that we have been wrong in the past, but now there's more and more evidence very clear that countries that insist on wearing masks, the infection rate is much lower than countries that do not wear masks. So you people, when you go to public place, with people place, not only practice, practice social distancing, you have to wear masks to protect other people and protect yourself. But what do politicians say? No. If you feel like it, you can wear a mask. Mask is not mandatory. Why? Because they want to have big gatherings. They don't want to scare people. In other words, the presentations of news is based on one not desire is to suit certain political ends. It's not based on facts, not based on science, not based on how the experts advise, which is very, very, a lot of people just agree the same thing, but in order to achieve certain political ends, it distorts the facts. The ends justifying the means. And I don't think this is biblical. I don't think this is biblical. So the second wolf I just mentioned is the wolf of using ends to justify the means. No matter if something is good that is achieved, I can do whatever means. After all, that will be good for the, the whole country. So I can choose whatever I win to instead of uh, including distorting the facts. And that, I don't think, is very good. The third wolf I would like to share with you, the first wolf is to uh, secular humanism. The second wolf is about end justifying the means. And those the two philosophies usually are very common to people, especially non-believers. But the remaining three wolves actually also happen to believers even within the church, there's some different thinking, deceptive thinking that we call false prophets in charge to snatch the sheep out of the flock. The third one is denying the inerrancy of the Bible. Uh, this is now the Bible readers now. The people who read the Bible. And even if you are Bible readers, be watch out for those next three types of wolves. 
The first word is the denying the inerrancy of the Bible. I myself is a culprit. When I become, I became a Christian when I was in high school, when I read the Old Testament, I find that there's something wrong in the Old Testament. Why? God instructed Israelites to go in the name of Canaan and then kill everybody. Wipe out all the people, including women and children. How can my God be so unjust, using just one nation, suppressing other nations, and then kill them all, even innocent children? So either something wrong with the God, I believe, or there's something wrong with the Bible. So I do not believe that the Bible is all correct. I believed at that time there's some errors of the Bible. Otherwise, how can my God be so cruel to allow people here? He allow people to, to be killed here. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 1, he said, I'll deliver them over to you. You have defeated them, and you must, you must destroy them totally. How can this God be this God, unjust God? No, no, no. There may be some, must be some errors in the Bible. But the Bible clearly mentioned that no, the Bible does not have errors. Maybe right now you may not understand the context. Maybe it's very against you, your belief, your feeling. But there must be some reasons. Because God protects his word. Because this word that is guiding many, many people from old times to new times to all, for all countries. So in order to protect, he protects his word very carefully. In Revelation chapter 22, 18 to 19 says, for this word, which is inspired, although the authors consist of prophets and kings of different generations, but the real author of the words of grace is me. And if anyone adds something to them, they'll be cursed. They'll be thrown out of the, the scroll, the scroll of life. And if anyone takes away the word away, they also be cursed. Don't add, don't subtract. God protect his word. So God word has no errors. Now understanding sometimes, maybe some of the teaching may be too foreign to us. It's very against our feeling, but the way to do it is to put aside and wait for the opportunity to ask somebody who know the Bible better and then keep, ask them to give you some explanation. But that will not hinder you from Believing the Bible is the whole truth. When I was high school, I believed in errors. So what happened? Then it caused my stagnation of my spiritual for 10 or 15 years. Why? Because I become the ultimate judgment whether the Bible is right or wrong. Who is the judge? You, me. It's actually back to humanism. I'm a foreign job. I can pick something that I think is right. I reject something that's not right. I think it's not right. That actually is humanism again. You selectively accept what's being teach. Select acceptance. What happened? Something you don't like, you don't follow. Something you like, you follow. As a result, it will lead to big stagnation of your spiritual growth. So don't fall victim to this approach. The wolf of believing that there's some errors in the Bible. I myself have fallen victim to that thought and caused stagnation of my spiritual for 10 to 15 years. It's terrible. Ah. The fourth wolf I would like to ask you to guard against Again, it's reading the Bible. Now it's not saying the Bible has errors, but they try to use the Bible to suit their own life, to see a thought. So they tend to uh, take the Bible out of context. Try to use the Bible to justify the behavior. So they, when they study the Bible, they do read the Bible, but they just put select some passages in the Bible to, to justify their possession. We talk about gay rights, homosexuality, people who support 
homosexuality sometimes, including Christians themselves. They said, actually, the Bible has nothing to give you against homosexual right. But he said, it's very clear. In the Old Testament time and New Testament time, there are a lot of passages that shows that God condemned this uh, uh, homosexual orientation. But he said, no. He said, okay, Old Testament, by very clear example, Sodoma, Gomorrah. The reason why God destroyed the city because they, they practice homosexuality. The way the word so, so, Sodomism actually comes from this word, Sodoma, Sodom. Then the people who read the Bible say, no, 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 no. You read this wrong. So let me help you read this passage. He said, you can go back to, this is their thought. Now you can go back to the Bible, Ezekiel, for example. Ezekiel also mentioned my Sodom. He said, now this is the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters were arrogant, overfed, unconcerned, and did not help the poor and needy. So the reason they were being destroyed is not because of homosexuality, because they're the two overfed, arrogant, uh, and do not care about the poor. They don't have social justice. That's why they are destroyed. But they did not read further. They were haughty and did detestable things before me. They could emphasize the first part and ignore. But what is detestable? In fact, Leviticus actually say the same thing. That's why you have to read the Bible, not just from one passage. You have to systematically gather all these teachings about sexual orientation and see what's the biblical perspective. Leviticus 18.22 say that, do not have sexual relations with a man, not a man with a man, as he does it with a woman. That is detestable, the same word, detestable. So when you read the Bible, don't just put it out of context. That's why when you study Bible, one of the ways to study is called, called inductive Bible study, or sometimes called systematic theology. What is systematic theology? Systematic is systematically pull out all the verses within one concept or one major issue, for example, sexual orientation, homosexuality, and see the Old Testament and New Testament all put them out and put, and put them together and see which is more ordinary mentioned? And what is more direct reference and so indirect guessing implication? This is why called the principles of humanetics. 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 There are some basic objective rules to analyze the Bible. If it becomes more and more frequent, a lot of dimension, it's just one tiny event here. So the thing that's more frequent over Trump, Trump over this one tiny occasions mentioning. Or direct mentioning the state of position is made more than an indirect reference, indication. If you do that, you systematic, and you can see very clear the Bible is against homosexuality. But you know that people who do not read the Bible they say, okay, they have the point. Well, different people, different point. You believe that this is not right, then they got the right to do the. Uh, also, the Bible also does not. Uh, disprove sexual orientation and homosexual sexuality. Then you'll be slashed away. Oh, everybody can suit your taste, your preference. This is how you read the Bible. But you don't just read the Bible to suit your taste. You have to be humble to the review to of God. And the way to know that is to systematically, systematically study the Bible instead of just pull something out of context. So this, even Bible readers, commit these mistakes a lot. Or they fall into the victims of this wolf called taking out of context. So be careful. Read the Bible carefully. Uh, don't be misguided. So we talk about this as one example. So what is the final wolf, the fifth wolf I've in mind? Actually, we go to the other extreme. These are people who hold on the Bible wholeheartedly, stubbornly, firmly. But this one can also lead you to forward him to another wolf. That's the other extreme. We start to 
left extreme to the right extreme. Don't go to the extreme. The extreme is close-mindedness. You think because your upbringing, your traditions, you have gone to Sunday school, you listen to many messages, then you have a set of thoughts. This is the way you understand the Bible, teaching the doctrines and apply it to my life. And you have been brought up in church for a long time, and that has been being told a long time. So that's the truth. Then I have hold a hold on to such truth. Anything against that, I reject. Because I have to hold on. Otherwise, I will, I will fall down. I have to stand firm. Now, having stand firm with people is all right. It's actually good. However, be careful. You are a human being. Sometimes the way you understand the Bible may be beyond what God wants. And you need to let God, the other people, through other people, other services, to tell you may be wrong. Then you have to keep adjusting, keep refining, keep learning. Don't just close your mind. So the fifth word is the word of close-mindedness. We are human beings. We are finite beings. Even reading the Bible, sometimes we make mistakes. We will extend what God's teaching. So be open-minded, humble, and willing to listen. And re- listen doesn't mean you have to follow, but at least you are to listen to see, check the Bible, is it right or wrong, and pray to God. That's why I said, Paul said, I entrust you to the word of grace at the same time, God himself. That's why daily devotion, morning devotion is so important. Guidance. You have to have a soft heart to listen. Keep listening. Very good example in the that gospel, John, he talked about how Jesus healed the blind man. But the Pharisees, because they want to hold on to the doctrines, the doctrines initially is good intention, but it has been modified. For example, Sabbath, Sabbath is actually to, for men to give them rest. But they start setting a lot of new tradition, new rituals, and they don't do anything in Sabbath. And when Jesus healed this blind man on Sabbath, it violates his rule, it violates his doctrine, then it must be from Satan. So they tried to use the blind man and accuse Jesus, say that he should not do this kind of thing on Sabbath. But the blind man said, if he's a sinner, how come God listened to him? But the Pharisee said, are you going to give me a lesson? I'm a teacher. I know the law better than you. It must be Satan because I violate the law, violate the word. Instead of having a soft heart, they already have a set mind. Anything that's beyond attacking the, the traditional thought is wrong. Why? Because the heart is not soft. They cannot see that Jesus is a loving God. Heal people, so the love. And Sabbath, instead of uh, practicing the rituals, you have to go back to the meaning of Sabbath. What do I mean by keep the Sabbath holy? Sabbath is made for men, but not men for the Sabbath. But they do not see that. They're well-intentioned. They hold on to that. They say, oh, we have to defend anything against this heresy. They think Jesus is a heretic. They even crucify Jesus. They want to hold on to the traditional practices. They refuse to listen and change. Another example we talk about is Paul Apostle. We talked about Paul earlier. You know, Paul is very passionate. You think the Christians actually is against their tradition, their good things, what happened? He's so passionate. He watched how people killed the first martyr, Stephen. At the same time, he himself, getting the permissions of the high priest, he went down to Damascus to, to persecute and arrest, arrest Christians because to him, these are the people who are radical, who are going to overthrow, challenge our faith. So we have to persecute them, arrest them, put them in prison so that they will not affect other big cancer. But on the way to Damascus, what happened? Jesus appeared to him. So, so, where do you, why do you persecute me? Then he was enlightened and he changed 180 degrees. Even Paul himself made this mistake. He holds on to things that he believes too and passionately fight those people who do not agree with him. 
So don't commit the same mistake. Understand that we are high human beings. Sometimes my interpretation is not correct. The application is no longer true. So we have to keep at that. It doesn't have to change all the time, but you have to pray and ask God to guide you. I think you know this word called geocentrism. It means that it believes that all the planets around the world are in the universe actually as rotating, uh, using Earth as the center. For several centuries, you know that, a lot of people believe in that. Quite a few centuries believe in that. Even Bible believers also believe in that. Even theologians, uh, very good Christians believe in that. You call geocentrism. And that makes sense. Why? Because God in the uh, Genesis may come, maybe create a lot of living be beings, but he created man on the final day and said making man is very good. So human beings have a, a special possession in God because God made us in his image. All other enemies, all of the things are not made in his image. So all this universe actually is made for us. Since he, man is living on the earth, so by, by reverence then most likely, because we only see people, this, the, the planets, the stars around, so most likely these planets just rotate around us all the time, circulate around us all the time, revolving around all the time. But that's not, that's not in the Bible. It's just a reference, it's an inference. Since we are so important in the mind of God then, and then we're living on earth, then the, all the things start just rotating. Around. So for s quite a few centuries, the thought is that we have this called geocentrism. Until one day, an Italian came out. His name is Copernicus. And he studied astronomy. He find out that, yeah, look in the star. But if you believe the hypothesis, the, the earth is the center, it's very strange. Other star seems to, after a while, jump. Jump, jump. It doesn't follow a very smooth path. Jump, jump, jump. However, if I turn my paradigm, instead of using sun as an earth as sun, if I suppose that sun is center and all planets are surrounding the sun, then what happened? Eh? I can see they're following a very smooth path. It's not just the earth. All the things, all the planets around the sun, actually the same thing. So Copernicus suggests that it's called Heliocentrism, instead of circulating around, the earth is rotating using the earth, the sun as the center. It's based on facts. You know, he dare not publish his work because he thinks it's against church doctrine. But he's a scientist. So have to tell the people that that's not the truth, that it's not geocentrism, it's a heliocentrism. So finally, you know, this work changed the modern science, was one of the masterpieces of science. So, people, brothers and sisters, be watch out. Now, you may be well intended, you say that all the planets are around the world, but maybe you're wrong. The Bible did not say that, but you go further than the God. Martin Dukin, after visiting the Rome, the Catholic Church, he would belong to he's a He's a brother within the Catholic Church, and he sees a lot of bad behavior of the Pope and also the cardinals, bishops. And then he came down, came back and nailed down the 95 Jesus and exposing the wrong done by the church authority. And you know what? It's a challenging tradition, big challenge, and people call him radical and reject him and persecute him. Luckily, God protect him. And because of Martin Luther, we have to launch the call Reformation, the Protestant Church, and important doctrine called justification by faith. Then Christians can really live out a genuine faith instead of having use of rituals of Catholic Church, which bind us. Without Martin Luther, then we don't have the present church, Protestant Church. At that time, people think that it's challenging. The traitorous practice, we should arrest him. So the fifth wolf is what? The fourth wolf is, you don't want to listen. You already set up your mind. Close-minded, no. 
we human beings limit, including how we interpret the Bible. Now, we have a lot of historical evidence that our scholars, the help us keep teaching us this. The majority should be good, but also pretend that, prepare that as new things comes out, new things come out, we say, oh, we will send it to spark incorrectly. Or the application, we, are, we, we, we think the application is the truth. Actually, there's only application, the application can change, but the principle doesn't change. So we are willing to listen, reflect, checking. And most important, pray to God. That's why devotion is so important. The word of God is the light post, the general principles, but at the same time, is the lantern upon your feet. As you walk, you do morning devotion. God keep telling you, you got to have soft heart to listen to him. And using to the environment and listen to, to other people. They may be wrong, but open your ears, have a dialogue and listen to them and then come back and check the Bible and pray to God so that you may, can make good decisions. Instead of resisting change, listen and improve. So in summary, we talk about the five rules that we have to watch out for as Christians. They try to snatch us away from the flock. One is secular humanism. Think that you are the human being is the final judge of truth. The second one is that depends on the end. If the answer is good, then whatever I do, that's fine. The third one, believe their Bibles, errors, the holes. I can select what I want to listen. Something is good, I think it's God's word. Something is not good, it's not God's word. It's just human writing. Or you try to select certain part of the passage and justify your position. You have your position already, you just pull something out. You don't systematically study all the words and combine them and judge using the principle of humanetics. Or you go to the actual extreme. What you believe is always right. Anything that may challenge that you say always wrong. See, there's a little problem. There's a little problem. It must be from Satan. Just like the Pharisees accusing Jesus. You heal people on Sabbath. They just look at the Sabbath healing, the act. They do not see the other big picture. The love, the care, and then reflect. What's the real meaning of Sabbath? Sabbath is for man. God created us not to hinder human beings. It's give them rest. Jesus already said that the end times is coming and in end times, there'll be a lot of false prophets. So watch out because many people will be deceived and follow them. By the same token, the apostle Paul also warned, I'm now leaving for Jerusalem. I'll be there, I'll be arrested and persecuted. But before I leave, I give you some important warning. There will be wolves coming in your midst. Even arising among yourselves, so-called Christians, and the purple is snatch you away. So what do you do? I can't do anything now because I'm going through Jerusalem, but I can give you two things. I commit you to God and his words of grace. God and his word. As I mentioned, the 2000 year, 2020, is a year of perfect storm. You're being bound up by many different things at the same time. The different thoughts in the media, a lot of discussions. So as a Christian, how I honor God in my walk of daily life. Sometimes you get confused. It's a confusing world. So today, I give you two things. I entrust you to God himself, get close to him, and his word of grace. Let's bow our heads and pray. Dear Heavenly Fathers, thank you for getting us together to worship you. While being bombarded every day for so many events, all come at the same time, we get confused. Puzzle, what should we do to do the right to stand firm in this confusing world? Thank you for giving you the word to us let us study it well, 
instead of just putting passage to suit ourselves, let you speak, let God speak for himself. At the same time, let's pray and God guidance to read the Bible. And we are ready to admit that we are, we are wrong. We listen, listen to other people and then come back and pray. And God, you, you guide us so that we reflect your glory. We sought and light of this confusing world. And then more people, instead of being snatched away from the flock, we bring more people to the flock. Be sought and light of this world. Thank you. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.